Okay, our second talk uh, is entitled uh, Efficient IDC, a Faster Incremental Dynamic Controllability Algorithm. Our speaker is Mike Carol Nielsen, and I'll pass the microphone to him. Does this work? Is it okay? Okay, fine. Thank you. Uh, so I will get right through it. To it, um, just about to start my clock. Okay. Uh, so an overview of this presentation. I will start with a, uh, a short ex example of simple temporal networks and a scenario where they can be used. I will talk a bit about existing algorithms, and as we have heard, there's been some development this spring. Uh, I will specifically talk about the fast IDC algorithm and our contribution in this paper, efficient IDC. And then in the end, I will revisit the existing algorithms updated with the latest results. <coughs> and so this scenario I will use is called the UAV delivery <coughs> scenario. And in this scenario, I'm uh, at my vacation place, and I suddenly feel the need for a good book. And so I go online, visit the bookstore. I make s special delivery, so I tick I want to have it delivered by UAV. And I give my location. And unfortunately for this scenario, it cannot be delivered to my door because that's too dangerous. And so I will have to walk a bit to a safe place where the UAV can land. And uh, in this uh, delivery scenario, there is also a contract between the buyer and the seller. And so I sign that I will not keep the UAV waiting for more than five minutes for when it comes to the delivery location. And also Amazon promised me that I should not have to wait more than 10 minutes until the UAV arrives. And if we want to model this with an STNU, it will look something like this, where we have the, uh, does it work if I stand this way? Yeah. Okay, so we have the, uh, the events of the scenario, which are the nodes of this graph, and then we have uh, at the edges of the graph, and that's the actions in the scenario. And so typically for an STNU, we need to have interval bounds on all these durations. Um, and then we also have the constraint. Uh, yeah, so it wasn't working. Or it was oh, sorry. Can't see that. Okay. So we also have this uh, requirement of five and ten minutes of waiting, which is over here. And uh, so in this uh, formalism, we have controllable events, which we can decide exactly when we want to do, at what time we want to execute them. And we have these requirements constraint. And as a comparison, in an STN, a simple temporal network, this is all that you have. So you can control all the events. But in a more realistic setting, you cannot do this. And so we have here the uncontrollable events, which are the blue ones. So for instance, Amazon may decide when they want to start the UAV in the morning, and then it makes several runs. But it can, they cannot decide exactly when they will start doing my delivery, depending on how long the others take. And so this is an uncontrollable uh, event. And so the uncontrollable events, we cannot affect them, but we can observe them. And so we will use these observations to try to prevent the requirement constraint from being uh, violated at execution time. And in comparison, again, to STN, normally there is no static schedule for which you can decide the times of the controllable events. In some cases you can, and that's when you have strong controllability, uh, but I will not talk about that. So. The important property then is, can we assign time to the controllable uh, event so that we do not violate these um, requirement constraints and taking into account that we can get help by observing the uncontrollable events. And so in this example, where a fly action, for instance, takes between 33 and 40 minutes, then we cannot decide when the UAV will be at the location. How do we go about our only controllable time point? What do we decide for this? And so one way would be to observe when the UAV starts from Amazon. <laughs> and so perhaps Amazon will send me an SMS saying, now the helicopter starts. And then I can use this information and say that, well, I know it's going to take the UAV between 33 and 40 minutes to arrive. So I will sit home and wait 25 minutes, and then I will go. And we will see that this is OK. So we can execute this, and everybody is happy. So I will arrive at the location between 30 and 35 minutes after the UAV starts, and the UAV will arrive between 33 and 40 minutes. And so the difference in time ends up in this interval, which respects this constraint. And so everybody is happy. 
And of course, it's when you have a small STNU, you can reason about this, but as soon as they become large, you need good algorithms. And uh, in, in my department, we do uh, planning. So that's the reason for doing STNUs. So the planner builds an STNU at the side while it's making its plan. And since the planner is a forward chaining planner, it, it incrementally builds this STNU. And so it adds actions, typically it adds a node or one or more constraints in each step. And if you have a plan which is non-DC, you can never restore dynamic controllability to it by adding more constraints. And so if the plan ever becomes non-dynamically controllable, we need to backtrack directly. And so we will be testing this network several times. And to be able to do this efficiently, we need an incremental solution which can verify over time that it stays dynamically controllable. <laughs> and if we look at the algorithms available to us from the start of this year, uh, we have these four algorithms. And so we have the first algorithm by Morris and Mushitola and Vidal, which is from 2001. And then this has been elaborated on by Morris and Mushitola and Morris to reach this N4 algorithm, which was mentioned before. And uh, as you say that these both algorithms use a different uh, type of notation than the original algorithm. And then on the side, we have a parallel track, which is incremental. And here we have only one algorithm, the fast IDC algorithm, which has been called a bit different things over the years. But it's uh, been developed by John Steddle and uh, people from Brian Williams' group. And so this was what we could choose from. And so we choose to implement fast IDC. And if we take a look at how the algorithm looks, uh, without going into the details, uh, first, it's uh, sorting all the edges that are changed in the increment. And then it goes through these edges. And it, when it's uh, looking at one of the edges, it calls this edge a focus edge. And for each of these focus edges, it will try to use one of these nine derivation rules to derive new constraints, which will help prevent uh, the violation of this edge. And after it has done this, it will recursively call itself and so a new constraint which is derived will lead to new constraints that has to be protected and so forth. So there will be a lot of, of derived edges. And if we take a look at one example, uh, the D1 rule. So in this case, we have a, an uncontrollable duration between C and B. So the C is the start of something which takes between two and 10 minutes. So I don't know, perhaps I'm going downhill from a mountain or something, it takes between two and 10 minutes. And then uh, a requirement constraint is put between nodes A and B, which says that I shouldn't re the, reach the bottom of the mountain before or after seven minutes has passed from A. And so the algorithm will then trigger this derivation rule and come up with something to protect this requirement constraint from being violated. And in this case, it's a, a weight constraint, which in the extended distance graph notation that the algorithm uses is, is uh, captured by a conditional edge. So what this edge says is that, well, A should not execute until it has seen B execute, at which case it's safe, because then B will not be too far away in time from A, or until three time units has passed from C. And in this case, we know that even if the worst case happened, that it takes 10, uh, 10 minutes for this, there will still be within the seven minutes bound here. And so this is how the algorithm works. And uh, if we look at the graph and, and how the edges are generated, they will typically propagate towards the start in something like this. And here, the start of time is to the left. And so the derived edges will, will reach a stop when they come to the start. And so this is a more uh, advanced example where we see that we, have, we, we start out with something like this, a network which is uh, quiescent, nothing happened. And then we add a new edge and we see what, what this will lead to. And so we will see propagations of, and applications of these derivation rules. And uh, the, the new derived constraint, the red one in this case, the source of this will move towards the start of the network again. And if the constraint becomes positive, which happens when it uh, switches to green here, uh, the target of the constraint that is derived will move towards the start. And so it, it goes. And an important feature of this algorithm is that for a derivation to take place, there has to be a, an interaction between a positive edge entering a node and a negative edge entering a node. Uh, and this is important. And it's also what gives, this, this, uh, gives the algorithm the feature that it moves towards the start. 
And so through the use of this algorithm earlier this year, we could prove that the first algorithm uh, is in fact also order N4, the same as, as the last one here. And uh, well, asymptotically they're, they're the same. We have not benchmarked them, but the, we feel that the theory for this is much easier to get a grasp for. So we're kind of happy with this result. Um, so fast IDC, it's quite quick, but it has some drawbacks. And in some places it's not as fast. And the strength of fast IDC is that it uses the focus edges, which gives us this directed uh, derivations, but it's also its weakness. And the, the problem is in which order should it um, choose the focus edges to derive from. And so what we have is a recursive edge processing order. And this is a problem in itself because recursion, uh, it's, it will go depth first towards the start. And so then it will backtrack and then it will go depth first again. And so it may uh, collide and overwrite values. And this is not so good. And so what we did first was to make a global queue where we keep all the, the focus edges. And we sort these edges as the algorithm also did, as we saw in the top of the algorithm. And uh, in the way that an edge is sorted by its uh, source node distance to the temporal reference, which is usually the time zero. It's just a point ahead of time for all nodes. Uh, and the positive edges are sorted on the target node distance. And uh, this helps with the problem of overwriting uh, constraints from recursion, but it does not help in all cases. So here's an example where it does not help. So if we have a, a, a large component which is connected by positive edges, and in this case, it's important that we have three sets of nodes. We have C nodes, we have B nodes, and A nodes, and they're also ordered uh, with regards to the temporal reference, so that all the C nodes are before all the B nodes, which are before all the A nodes. And if we add, no, wait. So there are some <laughs> edges as well, which I didn't put up here because they're too many. So for this example, we have N squared edges between the B and A nodes. So each B node is connected to all the A nodes. So this is, of course, a constructed example. Um, so if we now add an incremental change to this graph and run fast IDC, so we add this minus 250 edge, we will then get derivations which from this positive uh, negative interaction. So we will have minus one and 250 and they will react and give us minus 249. And we get this minus 150 in the, uh, here below. So in this case, since we have them in the cube on the distance from the temporal reference, it will, <laughs> it will take the, the lower edge first because A0 is furthest away from the temporal reference. And so it will process this edge and when it does so, it will derive N edges using these, uh, reacting with these edges from all the Bs which goes to A0. And this will cause N new edges to be derived and they all go from the Bs and they target C. And then it will also derive an edge from A1 to C which in turn also causes N edges to be derived from all the Bs to the Cs. And this goes on for all the A nodes. So for one edge uh, being derived from A0 to C, we get N squared number of derivations. And the majority of these will just be thrown away, but we have it, the algorithm has to try them. And so there will be a lot of derivations here. And uh, when they are over, when it's finally over, all these derivations are done, it will come back to the B nodes. And then so it will take the 249 edge and derive a new edge with weight 248. And so for all the B nodes, this will happen again. And so it will derive new uh, edges from A0 to C, all of them costing N square. And so if we have uh, roughly the size of order N in all of these sets, we will get N3 edges derived as it propagates through the Bs. And then we can do this with C nodes as well. And so in this example, uh, we can prolong this suffering for a while. So it will just spin around here for N3 times and then it will go past two C nodes and then it will start spin around again. But the focus is not C1 anymore, it's C3. And so if we, if we do this, we get N4 derivations in this case. And so this is, is uh, one place where the algorithm has problems. And this then gave us the idea for the efficient IDC algorithm where we just do away with the focus edges and say that, okay, we, we can't sort them in any way which makes us really happy. So we need to take the nodes one at a time. And so we have a focus node instead. And what we do for this focus node is that when this node is the focus node, we derive all incoming edges to this node before moving on. 
And to get rid of the problem with these positive regions, we use Dijkstra's algorithm. And so what we do is that uh, the algorithm, the efficient IDC algorithm, it keeps a copy of the graph, which looks like this. So it has all the same weights, but the reversed order of all the positive edges. And for any negative edge, it, it also reverses this. <coughs> and it may be that there are several negative edges going to C from this positive component. And in that case, it has to add a constant to all of them to make them positive. And uh, once that is done, we can run Dijkstra's algorithm. And we then immediately find that the shortest distance to A0 is 97. And if we subtract the constant of 250 that we added to make this edge positive, we get the final Titan constraint here. And this is then in, in time n square instead of uh, n3. And so the algorithm does this, and then it will do it for the next C value and so on for the n nodes, each taking n square time. So we end up with n3. And the algorithm looks like this. Um, well, I, I didn't plan to go into any details, but it has a set, which we call it a do set, which contains all the nodes that we need to process. And it's, uh, it, every iteration it takes one node, and it tries to derive all the incoming conditional edges, and then it derives all negative requirement edges, and then all incoming positive edges. And then it takes the next node. And so duration of edges are done using Dijkstra over here in these three helper functions. And uh, well, and the uh, runtime for this becomes amortized N3 because um, an unfortunate uh, result is that it requires the nodes to be ordered correctly. So for a node to find all incoming edges, it must know for sure that all the other nodes that can cause incoming edges have been processed. And we don't know that for sure. And so when we run this, we may discover a new order between nodes. And then we need to go and run this node. To, and then we need to go back again and reprocess the first node so that we don't miss anything. And uh, in a graph, we can uh, at maximum have uh, n squared reprocessings because a negative edge is an ordering. And we can maximum have so many negative edges. So it becomes <coughs> amortized n3. And so recently we presented another version which takes the edges in another, uh, the nodes in another order. And this actually becomes N3. And so in this case, uh, for each node A, we have a set of nodes which have negative incoming edges to it. And we don't process A until we have processed all nodes in S. And through some several pages proof, we can show that this makes it order N3. So there are no need for reprocessing. So finally, if we, if we take some look at the defining traits of this algorithm, we see that it's using fast IDC derivations in another way, but it's using the same derivations. Uh, it's using the reverse positive distances in this Dijkstra graph, and it uses a limited Dijkstra run over this. It's limited because after a while we can cut off because there will be no derivations if the edge become too positive. Uh, and also, we detect non-DC from uh, cycles containing only negative edges. Uh, and as we heard uh, one month back, the same result has been published by Morris. And uh, he also does these four things, but he does them in his notation. And so it's a bit different, but I believe at the core it's the same algorithm. And he, of course, we had the incremental focus, and he did not. So he actually proved that it solves full verification of the network. And so the current state of algorithms looks like this, where we have basically two algorithms which solve the same problem in uh, order N3. And uh, I guess we will have to benchmark and see which one is better between these. And uh, the implications of this are quite big, as I told some people before, that if you have a temporal reasoner or a planner which uses STNs and you use full verification, then you can just switch to using STNUs and you can have uncontrollable durations for free asymptotically because it's, it's handling STNs is also N3. But if you do something incremental, then this algorithm will not replace STNs because you can do quicker things for them. Uh, and that's the end. Thank you. Okay, uh, uh, questions? Uh, Mark. <coughs> oh. so, um, there's something that, that 
may have been in there. I just couldn't get it out, which is not a criticism. I may, I may just be, yeah. you know, it's the afternoon. Um, a lot of algorithms for reasoning about SDNs that, that say they're n cubed. It's n cubed because you might have n squared edges, right? Yeah, the worst case. Yeah, sure. But uh, an awful lot of uh, the temporal networks that you run across in practice are, you know, um, you don't have n squared edges. You have like 3n edges or 5n edges, yes. um, which means against that, the, the performance is considerably better. What I couldn't tell is um, what that would do for your algorithm, because if you're actually adding edges to achieve the controllability you want, are you risking, um, you know, going from 3n or 5n back to n squared or not? I would say that. Usually you see a lot of edges being derived. Okay. Uh, so so you're, you could use this on an STN and it wouldn't hurt you is true in the if worst, it's a bit, yeah, the in very the, worst, in the worst case. case. So, I, I, yeah. So okay. I, let's go back. So I would say asymptotically it would not hurt you. I mean, for large. Yeah, but I, I wouldn't try this on a large temporal network. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe I should say there's been, I mean, there are different versions of classifying STNs as to the width of the graph and things like that. And I know that Planken has several algorithms to make it quicker in those cases. So perhaps those have to be carried over here, these ideas. Hey, so um, good work. And also, um, would you be able to go back a few slides to where you were talking about negative cycle detection? Uh, well, well, this will probably do, right? So um, how are you doing negative cycle detection? Because you mentioned earlier on um, that you wanted to look at negative cycles which were composed only of uh, negative edges. So yeah, is well, that? Well, there are two, two places where, where you can detect non-dynamic controllability. Uh, and one is, one is here, if the negative cycle is detected. So uh, this is a result from last year for the fast IDC algorithm, that you need to keep track of all the negative edges to prevent ne a negative cycle. And so this is done in a separate graph, which takes care of this part. Yeah, so my question is actually about that. Um, is that a sufficient condition? Like just keeping track of the negative edges or? If, if you want to find negative cycles consisting of paths, I mean if you have a path, you may have positive and negative edges in this path. Mm -hmm. So then it's, it's okay only to worry about negative uh, edges. And uh, this come from this positive negative uh, interaction. So if you have a path which contains some positive edges and some negative, there will be derivations caused by this and you will replace the positive ones by the sum so it will become negative. So if you have a negative cycle, there will be a cycle containing only negative edges. Okay. But then you also have this uh, if G is squeezed condition down here. And this is more a local thing where you check that the dynamic uh, or the uncontrollable durations are not squeezed. So there are two places where it detects this. All right, great, thanks. Uh, Jeremy? So the, uh, the, new, the new algorithm by Paul Morris and, and your algorithm have the same worst case complexity uh, and you said that you need to benchmark them, but do you have a sense that the incremental algorithm could be faster for incremental maintenance or uh, are you just not sure yet? No, I would say it's not faster. I mean, if I compare the algorithms, they do the same thing. Oh, I see. Okay. So, yeah. So Paul is incremental also? Well, no, it's, I mean, if you saw the full problem, you solve the incremental because it's a part of the full problem. Yeah. Ah, okay. So, so I can just add, add to that. Was the, the original motivation for, for John Stett or John, my algorithm for the FAST IDC was that we're supporting a temporal planner, right? Yeah. And that when it's searching through a space possible plans, you know, successive candidate plans are only a small perturbation from each other, yeah. right? So in the same spirit of for example, incremental A star, right? What you're trying to do is you like the algorithm on the right to converge to the performance on the left-hand algorithm, but the whole point of that is to be able to perform well yeah. without having to restart from scratch when there's a small perturbation. Yeah. So have you have you tried to do those? But so that's a, that would be a good thing to do um, benchmarking on. Now the yeah. other thing that's important in one of those fast IDC algorithms is to be able to extract some form of no good. So does your algorithm extract or conflict? So it mean a minimal inconsistent set of temporal constraints 
So does your algorithm extract that information as well? Uh, no, it would not. So, would so that would be a key addition. Yeah. Uh, yes, Chris. So, so in the context of something like temporal planning, you want incremental because you're doing some search in the plan space, but you also want decremental if you're if you're backtracking. Yeah, so it, it's a forward chaining planner. And so what we do is chronological backtracking. So basically, we, we just set a, a, a backtracking point, and then we work from that. And if something happens, we roll back to this point. And so you've memorized the, the point is where you've memorized the old graph and the data structures. Yes. Yeah. OK, let's uh, thank the speaker. <laughs> That's it.